Welcome back. We're in 2 Nephi chapter 3. And it's taken me a minute to, to want to approach this chapter, to be quite honest with you. This, this chapter presents a lot of problems for me. Um, but before we start the reading, I just would like to share a story um, about Joseph Smith. And um, this is about Zion's camp. And the men were setting up their tents and they came across some prairie rattlesnakes. And their first instinct was to eradicate them because that's the natural man, <laughs> you know. But if we were to be looking at this story and we're thinking, oh, these are men in the middle of the 1800s and they want to kill rattlesnakes because they're setting up their tents where they're going to be sleeping, most of us wouldn't bat an eye. Most of us would go, yeah. Of course, you know, but then there, there are some of us who, for whatever reason, have this thing about animals, even the bad ones. <laughs> and um, when we hear stories about people, you know, stamping out life, um, it, it just doesn't ring true. It doesn't feel right. So, um, so when I heard this story... Um, I, for lack of a better word, I was won over by Joseph Smith. And in my heart, this was a person that I could trust and believe. Does it mean that he's perfect? No, never, never have I, thank, I thank the Lord that my parents, um, raised me. And maybe it is because of my Native American background that I was taught question everything whatever you hear anybody say if it doesn't sound right if it doesn't ring that familiar bell to you like know that yep i like that because it rang in my soul true and then if you hear things and you don't feel that feeling question question if people are telling you that's the truth when you feel in your heart it is not so I was raised by incredible people who taught me to question, to question. Um, and as a result of that, because, you know, and like I shared last time, you know, my traits at church are not very appreciated because I'm a questioner. And, and I have literally been told by the stake president's wife, you think too much. <laughs> Could you dumb it down a little bit and quit using, you know, you think God, you know, we're only 10%, you know, in tithing and in brain. Just just stick with the 10%. <laughs> but that is pretty much how it came across. Stop thinking. Stop questioning. Stop wanting to know more. You know, of course, we read in the scriptures that those people who, who don't want to know more are the people from whom is going to be taken away. So for me, that's sound, that somebody telling me don't want to know more, don't question more, that, that was like alarm bells, alarm bells. <laughs> but back to this story. So they're pitching their tent. They found the rattlesnakes, and this is what Joseph Smith said to them. Let them alone. Don't hurt them. How will the serpent ever lose his venom while the servants of God possess the same disposition and continue to make war upon it? Men must lose their, oh wait, men must become harmless before the brute creation. And when men lose their vicious dispositions and cease to destroy the animal race, the lion and the lamb can dwell together and the sucking child can play <clears throat> with the serpent in safety. So that's what he said to them. The millennium can't come if you keep acting like animals to animals, towards animals. And it, that, wow, that rang like whew, it's big, you know, in a cartoon. There would have been fireworks over my head and streamers. <laughs> there would have been trumpets. Da, 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 you know? <laughs> because for me, this is someone who gets it. Okay, for me, this is someone that knows God. Wow, this is someone 
that has a consciousness for all sentient beings. And for me, that made him a prophet. I have never, because of the amazing, awesome parents that I have, I have never treated anyone like they are better than anyone else. And I don't care what your calling is or what your income is or what your talent is. That is something that is, you're still a human. You're a human. You're just like me. You're just like me. And so it has, and I have been in some ways a weirdo when I grew up. I, you know, people would go crazy over stars and rock stars. And I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? That to me, and, and again, I, I really think I have to, my mother had this incredible Native American wisdom, <laughs> which to me is from God. These people, you don't worship any of those. Who, who are they? Who are they? You worship one. And I use the word one. <laughs> In the most um, open way possible. <laughs> Whatever that capital O and then any means to you. Whatever name you have given that great spirit, the creator of all. Whatever you have for a label, that one, that one. And so, uh, how grateful, Ooh, man, you know, some people have, you know, rich parents and some people have parents that just hand them everything. And what I got from my parents was worth more than any material gift ever. Because one of the hugest pitfalls in this life is when people start to worship mortals and start to act like they can't make mistakes. And what happens is that really digs a, peep, a person, it digs an organization into a hole because then they're, they're up a tree trying to figure out how do we explain this mistake? How do we explain? Well, it's called mortality and we're all mortals. So whatever people have gone on to say about Joseph Smith and to accuse him of, he is still mortal to me. To me, he's like a friend. You know, so when, I, I've seen the, the greatness of his soul in this story, for example. Because as the result of what he said to these men, the brethren took the serpents carefully on sticks and carried them across the creek. And what an image that has always been to me of men carrying rattlesnakes carefully across the creek to save their lives. And I thought, if you could be that way toward a monster, you can be that way toward any human, couldn't you? You know, and so to me, this little story spoke volumes. And, and then also, because of this story, it became like a measuring stick for me. So when I heard anything that didn't reflect this <laughs> sorry everything I do they gotta be right there <laughs> they just kind of you know they gotta be like if I don't shut that door they're you know <laughs> but I have something going on in the backyard I can't have them out there right now so you're gonna have to suffer through this this video <laughs> <laughs> with the most ridiculous dog antics. Elaine, could you please not bite? <laughs> My little... Okay, so this gets really difficult when... Okay, so that became my measuring stick. So if anything else came subsequent, I would be like, what does this have to do with carrying rattlesnakes across the river? Because in this moment, he reflected perfectly the commandments of God, which are love. Love, and this to me reflected that quality so beautifully that if anything else 
does not reflect that consciousness, that level of spiritual evol evolution, <laughs> why it, it loses its veracity to me. It doesn't ring true like the others. Like, like, the, like some, of, some of the doctrines in the Book of Mormon are just, they're, they're amazing. And when you think that what Joseph Smith did restore, that, you know, babies don't need to be baptized, that we're born innocent, that Eve actually had grand qualities that allowed her to, to pass through that trial of her own um, willingness to defy God to know more. And, you know... <laughs> You, you, you think that's bad. Most Christians think that's terrible. And, you know, being a parent and, and, and likening the scriptures to me, when I saw the fiery spirit of my children and their willingness to defy what was... <laughs> One time we were... My dad was a very intimidating man and he had a booming voice, okay? And he had a way of speaking that was like, made grown men shake in their boots at times, you know? But um, my, little, my little precious angel daughter, when she was only about three, my dad had a big globe on one of those stands, you know, and they spin. And so my daughter was having a grand old time just taking that world for a spin. You know, and she, she was doing this kind of thing. And my dad, who was doing, working on the computer at the time, Okay, I'm not going to lie, he's playing solitaire. But he was, <laughs> he was, con needed concentration, okay? And so he goes, quit messing with that globe, you know? And he did it in a way, most children, most children would have gone, eh, you know, I would have. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, these guys. But my daughter just looked at my dad, three years old, looked at him. Took that globe for one more spin, poosh, and then walked away. <laughs> and 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 you're telling me there was not a sense of pride <laughs> in my daughter. I'm so sorry, but these guys. They, I I have this electrical cord, and she's been chewing on cords lately, and I cannot leave her unsupervised and I have to have this thing plugged in right now so anyway so this is this is what it's going to be <laughs> so and as you can tell I've not had the time in days so this is it <laughs> but that made me proud that made me proud that my daughter she may have as she may have been afraid but that she looked fear in the face and spun it anyway <laughs> you know? and I guess that's what I got to do with this chapter because this chapter presents a lot of problems to me and you know the, the whole Joseph Smith translation of the Bible presents a certain problems for me you know some I can totally see like with the whole Elohim thing and, you know, people are saying, no, he's wrong. Even James E. Talmadge said he's wrong. You know, uh, that Elohim connotes a plurality of excellence and that it, in the Church of Jesus Christ, he even, like, makes it, like, the official I as the prophet. I'm setting the standard right here. In the Church of Jesus Christ, Elohim means God the Father, boom, period. And that all Joseph Smith's musings about, about, um, Elohim being plural, being a council of gods, as he translated it, um, James E. Talmadge just said no. But then James E. Talmadge doesn't explain why later on in other parts of Genesis, you know, it's not just Elohim, it's also us, <laughs> as used. You know, so our, the word our is used, so... It's like, who's right, who's wrong? We're, we'll find out, that's for sure. It was James E. Talmadge or was Joseph Smith, you know? <laughs> you know, I always bank on Joseph Smith because I feel like he's a friend of mine. <laughs> and that you, you, you can go ahead and tear him down and find out anything wrong that you want 
I'm not saying anything you want. Obviously, if he was a devil lord. <laughs> but yes, was he totally mortal? 100%. Did he shoot back when he was shot at? You betcha. And I would too. <laughs> and anyone that says you cannot have a relationship with God if you would actually defend yourself, you know, a real saint would let himself die. Well, you know, that's interesting because the Book of Mormon takes that on. Yeah, there are people like that. There are people like that who actually... Elaine, stop. Elaine, stop biting. Elaine, no more biting. I No, you cannot bite. You come over here and you sit over here and you come over here. Hurry it up. Come on. Come on, Mark. No, no biting. Okay? So, <laughs> I'm sorry. I got to keep this one in a headlock for a little while. Because she's in a biting mode. Every time I looked up, she didn't know you stay. Elaine. <laughs> she had Marvin's cheek in her teeth. So, <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> anyway, I don't even remember where I was. The point is, is that to me, Joseph Smith is a friend. And, and when I find out terrible things that he's done or is accused of doing, I give him the full benefit of the doubt because people are so zeroed in on bringing this man down. And it's so crazy because when you look at the Bible and the convoluted way it's put together and, you know, and, and, and books were not written by the people whose names are on them. Oh, well, you should think of names more as camps, you know, it's like or or, or communities or clubs. And it's just like, well, then what does this all mean? You know, and, and they have things in there that I take deep offense to. Women should keep their mouth shut in church. Yeah, try stopping me, you know. I don't care who said that. To me, that's wrong. Again, when that consciousness does not agree, you know, women should shut up. That's not the same consciousness of men that carry rattlesnakes across the river to save them. And so to me, no, no. There are several things in the Bible that, that not only <laughs> I feel are not correct, but they are also not of the spirit of God the way he intended it, you know, remember, as I've shared before, all truth comes through a human being, sadly, unless we're studying nature or animals or something, then those are truths that speak directly to our souls. And that's why a lot of people become very ecologically or they become very invested in the world and very invested in animals because it's truth undiluted and it's the pure communication of God to our spirit. Anything else that comes through a man or through a person is an imperfect version because a person is imperfect. And the culture and his language and his upbringing and his parents or lack of his parents, the, all, like all these things in this person's life are, this is an imperfect being. And truth has to be filtered through that and there's only one source of perfect truth, and that, of course, is God, who works through the Holy Spirit. And most of us receive information through the Holy Spirit. And it's not directly, you know, through, through God. And a lot of times, my personal beliefs is that our dead continue to guide us. And that we continue to have spiritual interaction with them as well. And that they are present in our lives far more than we know and understand. And that they're rooting for us. And that since they've crossed over and their, their mortality has been wiped clean off of them in many ways. So they're not governed anymore by hormones. And they're not governed anymore by the need to sleep or hunger or anything, in some ways their mortality has been washed off of them. They have more of an ability to see. <clears throat> and so suddenly what was so important in life that was not of a spiritual nature has no meaning to them, <laughs> has no value. But their, their loved ones and their struggles is suddenly their mission for those who of course died you know, when they hit the ground running. And they're there for us. And so that, that consciousness and that awareness, 
of us being bound by love and all of that when when something doesn't ring true with that why I alarm bells go off in my soul now does that mean that um, I'm super judgmental on everything no in fact it makes me far less judgmental <laughs> Because I'm willing to concede that there are mistakes of doctrine in the Book of Mormon. And I'm willing to, you know, people, you know, it's so funny. You watch videos, oh, the mistakes in the Book of Mormon. And it's just like this. They're, they're being completely ingenuine. They're not being real with you. Well, the punctuation and the, they're not talking about anything, bro. And, and this word was misspelled, but then that has since been corrected. Like, literally, when they say mistakes, they're not talking. He, you know, he, that was just this person on this YouTube channel because, you know, he's so spiritually driven. He's trying to clickbait. Oh, they're actually going to address the problems in the Book of Mormon? <laughs> Click. Oh, this word was misspelled. Oh, the punctuation has some problems. Totally, totally ingenuine. <laughs> wasn't at all he has the leading experts on the book of mormon on there and that's all they can talk about is punctuation and and spelling errors and you're like okay um you know one thing that god does not like is people's inability <laughs> to be honest <laughs> if there's one thing that chaps his eye <laughs> It's when people try to hide their sins and their mistakes, both. Yes, there's a difference between sin and, and mistake. One has intention, one does. It doesn't matter. If something is incorrect, correct it. Fix it. Quit trying to dance around it and, and paint all over it, you know? Like you're trying to hide the, the failure and structure of a barn with new paint. Stop it. Quit painting over things. You need to address things because people have real spiritual needs. And this book is the only place they can turn for that level of Christ consciousness. This is the only book that you can turn to that, that tells you that God loves all his children in any era of time. And any place on the earth, and that he's speaking to all of them. This is the only book that tells you, yes, sin is terrible, has terrible consequences, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Get back out on your mission. Continue on with the work you started. Don't be afraid. This is the only book that says babies aren't guilty. That, that, and again, that Eve was this great person, like my daughter Sophie, <laughs> who had that spirit in her to spin that globe one more time and go for it. What's going to happen? You're not going to tell me what to do. I wasn't born for that. I wasn't born to be dumb and ignorant. <laughs> I was born to find out for myself. To me, that's fantastic. To me, Eve is a hero. And, and the things that people say about Eve, you know, our mother, our mother who did what she did so we could be born, and we have nerve to say anything but the same praise we give to Mary. So this, I guess you'd call this my testimony in some ways that I don't throw away truth. I don't care how it was wrapped. I don't care what mortal it passed through. Give me Charles Bukowski, you know, the, the, the womanizing alcoholic. He has gems of truth. Gems. Give me Joseph Smith. Give me anyone that's talking to the, speaking the truth and I will listen to you. I don't care. I don't care who you are. I know that truth exists in each one of us, and I know each one of us is capable of sharing truth no matter who we are and what we've done and where we've been. 
<clears throat> so with that in mind, we're going to talk about some hard things today for some people, you know, because for some people, they don't read the Book of Mormon like it's just, you know, um, some people, of course, it's God's word, and so then nothing can be in here. And it's the most correct book. You know, that the most correct, you know, it's kind of like saying the taco with the most beef. You know, it's like uh, there's more to a taco than just the beef. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is it's like it, it's deceptive. To me, it's deceptive language. It's like when people say, we have a cheesier burrito. burrito. <laughs> it's not even real cheese, but the language allows you to use the adjective because you're saying it's like it, you know, it's cheesy, you know. <laughs> so the language, so the most correct, I understand what he's saying because certain truths, you know, like babies are innocent. Certain things that I shared with before came back. Yes, yeah, you know, Woo! I, to me, Christianity makes no sense without God being as great as he is in the Book of Mormon. just doesn't. So yes, there are many great things, but my point simply is, is that it's not, it's not, I, it's not perfect, okay, by any stretch of the imagination. And it presents several problems. And so now I speak unto you, Joseph. Here's verse one, finally. My last born, thou wast born in the wilderness of mine afflictions. Yea, in the days of my greatest sorrow, didn't thy mother bear thee? You know, again, thanks, thanks, Dad. <laughs> Man, were we depressed when you came into the world. What a crappy time you were born. I was like, oh, okay, thanks, Dad. You wonder how old this kid is. You know, what, eight, five, who knows? And may the Lord consecrate also unto thee this land, which is... A most precious land. He says consecrate to him, but he, he was talking about other things when he said consecrate in the last um, ch ver chapter, <laughs> chapter two, um, which is most precious land for thine inheritance and the inheritance of thy seed with thy brethren for thy security. Again, he loves those trigger words, you know, security, safety, you're in danger, 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 layman, layman. <laughs> if it so be that you shall keep the commandments of the Holy One of Israel. And now, Joseph, my last born, whom I have brought out of the wilderness of mine afflictions, may the Lord bless thee forever, for thy seed shall not utterly be destroyed. <laughs> I'm sure Joseph's like, okay, consecrate the land, okay, um, brought, you know, blessed. Yeah. Utterly destroyed? I thought we were having a blessing here. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he's kind of like, wait, I thought the utterly destroyed house is a blessing again. Um, and then he starts this thing. For behold, thou art the fruit of my loins, and I am a descendant of Joseph. Oh, we could talk all day about Joseph, who was carried captive into Egypt. And great were the covenants of the Lord which he made unto Joseph. Okay, so first, when you, you read this, you think, oh, the covenants. So when he had the dreams that he was going to be a great one, you know, all oh, my sheaf and your sheaves all bowed to mine, and then the sun, the moon, stars, and they all bowed to me. <laughs> and even then, his dad's like, okay, just a minute here. His dad rebuked him. You're saying that even me and your mother, he was okay, apparently, <laughs> when Joseph told them that his brothers were going to bow down to him. This kid was a spoiled brat, and I'm sure Jacob agreed to that one. So, But when he heard that, oh, why, the sun and the moon won, uh, he, even he and his mother was gonna, were going to be bowing to him, that's when he finally said, okay, <laughs> that's it, you know. Again, the story of the thing that blows my mind in this chapter is, is contemplating that Lehi knew the story of Joseph and how many problems arose in the family and how much suffering, suffering and guilt and torment for years and decades came about because this father was willing to set up this dynamic in his family of having a favorite son. Um, and the difference between Lehi and Jacob were that Lehi never rebuked Nephi <laughs> in any way. They both were the same. They were the, the, the narcissist and the enabler. They were on the same menu, and they just tore those people apart. So, for behold, thou art the fruit of my loins, and I'm a descendant of Jones. Okay, we got that. And this fruit stuff, I, I, there's like in here like 20 times and it just drives me nuts because what's with all the fruit of the loom stuff i mean the fruit of the loin stuff <laughs> same diff though 
It's so annoying and, and it's just, you, you're repeating it 20 times in this verse and it's almost like it's, it, it makes the chapter really convoluted. It really does. It makes the chapter far more complicated than it has to be. And because most of the Book of Mormon just kind of like, it's just smooth sailing. Right here, starting at verse 4, this is where this is where it just starts getting really junky and weird and it does not match to me the rest of the language of most of the Book of Mormon at all. And largely because of that fruit of the lo loins 20 times. And it's like, what is this? You know, rarely is something repeated that much. People who wrote the scriptures were so mindful and careful of their language for the most part. Very. And they used things in a very intentional way. And repetition would have been a, a tool that they would have preserved for certain instances. And that's what I'm saying. And this with the that repetition of the fruit of my, of my loins is it does not ring true. It doesn't ring true with the rest of the Book of Mormon and with most of scriptures. Um, it, it just doesn't ring true. And the, 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 it gets more complicated because as he's saying these covenants, he's actually not talking about the covenants that Joseph said that I'm going to be great one day and you're all going to be bowing to me. Um, no, he's talking about a revelation or prophecy that Joseph of Egypt received um, and that was quoted or referred to by Lehi. So Lehi knows of this prophecy. And so he shares it right here in the Book of Mormon. The problem is, is this prophecy does not appear in the Bible. Mm -mm. It's not there. At, shortly after the Book of Mormon was published, Joseph Smith started working on his translation of the Bible. And right away... Right away, it was like the first thing he did when he was done with the Book of Mormon was to go back and write in this prophecy that Lehi had or that Lehi refers to into Genesis 50. Genesis chapter 50 is not a translation. You know, it, you know, I know the church likes to call it the Joseph Smith translation, but a translation is I'm going to take a meaning of a sentence and then I'm going to translate it over here into this language. That's translation. This is not a translation. He inserts 14 extra verses in chapter 50 of Genesis. He turns the last three verses of Genesis chapter 50 into 14, uh, into the 17 more verses. I think it's a lot. Okay. You could look at yourself and it's almost identical to second Nephi chapter three and, and look it up please and read it and then go back and read this. And you're going to see ding, 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 ding. <laughs> like he literally in the same order. He, t it's, it's like if somebody asked him, Hey, Lehi is referring to this prophecy of Joseph of Egypt, but it's nowhere in the Bible. A few months later, no, it's right here. Here it is. <laughs> so do you see the conundrum this causes me? So when I read that, you know, and nobody talks about this. Nobody talks about this. It, to me, that's crazy that nobody's talking about this. Because people are going to come across and across this and they're going to be like, hey, what about this? <laughs> What's going on here? You know, because a lot of people have accused Joseph Smith of simply just filling it in because he had this prophecy that Lehi is referring to. And so he's thinking, I, I better I better fill in the blank here. you know. <laughs> and then. On the other hand, some people, and then the other camp says, no, he saw that prophecy. He read the prophecy and he went and inquired of the Lord. And he said, tell me where this comes from and, and what it is. And then he was able to put that in and he put that in, in, in 50. Um, so whatever it is, <clears throat> however you want to see it, my point is simply that <clears throat> as a person, I think he was exceptional, Joseph Smith. <clears throat> was he perfect? by no stretch of the imagination. 
do I throw out everything because he wasn't? No, because I'd be throwing everything out. <laughs> every, every piece of clothing, every book in my house, everything would have to be thrown out if, if, it was, if I had to judge the truth by the, by the messenger. <laughs> You know, the, the saying is don't, don't kill the messenger, but also, you know what? Don't set the messenger up on any kind of pedestal. Don't do it because you're setting yourself up for bitter disappointment. People are people are people and they, we all have sins and weaknesses. And if you don't, you're, you're lying to yourself. Um, and, and, and God doesn't, God isn't too fond of liars. The woman at the well, perfect example. Oh, now he could reveal to, to her, I, I'm the Messiah, you know? Because she goes like, you're telling the truth. Wow, what a great compliment to have from God. Hey, you're telling the truth. Wow, you're a human that has reconciled your good side with your bad side. You're telling the truth. You're incredibly friendly. You know, you're, you're, you're kind, but you're accused and you know what you're guilty of. You're telling the truth. You know you. And, and what an incredible compliment. <laughs> okay. He's saying, keep reading. Okay. She's saying, sorry. <laughs> and wherefore Joseph truly saw our day and he obtained a promise of the Lord that out of the fruit of his loins, the Lord God will raise up a righteous branch into the house of Israel, not the Messiah, but a branch which was to be broken off. Never, nevertheless, to be remembered in the covenants of the Lord that the Messiah should be manifest unto them in the latter days in the spirit of power unto the bringing of them out of darkness unto light, yea, out of hidden darkness and out of captivity and freedom. So, for the sake of this chapter, even though I, I, I have some issues with this chapter, doctrinally, I agree, you know, that when you do receive truth, that you are brought out of darkness and that you are um, and out of captivity unto freedom. 100%. I totally agree with that, that... Um, that there are things, information and teachings and all sorts of things that can liberate you, that can free your mind from idiotic concepts that are bringing it down. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, the, the doctrinal gems in this chapter, yes, there are, there are wonderful doctrinal gems. How they came to us, yeah, I got issue. <laughs> with those things but do i love the things that are being said yes i do um and i do agree and now he's saying he's of course he's saying that they are the ones that are broken off they are the ones that have the bow that has grown over the wall you know in the scriptures um the wall being any type of <clears throat> barrier that whether it be mountains or the ocean what something that they, people have to climb over to get out of um that that the that's them the descendants of lehi these are the people that are going to be brought out of darkness um because the covenants are going to be remembered and they are the righteous branch for joseph truly testified saying okay and this is where it starts and um as i said in the joseph smith translation um Okay, let's see how many. I'm going to tell you exactly. It's 38 verses. So, and it starts at verse 24. So that's for yeah, 14. <laughs> no, that's that's 14 verses altogether, and it originally goes to 27. So 14 minus 3 is 11. Okay, so 11 extra verses. Let's get our numbers right. Um, so this is where it starts, and you will find the exact same language. For example, when you um, read both and both and, and you'll see you'll see it back going back and forth but continuing on okay so for Ju joseph joseph truly testified saying a lord a seer shall the lord my god raise up who shall be a choice seer unto the fruit of my loins i hate that term what's with all the fruit you know and the loin it's just it's such an it to me it's a vulgar phrase. It's so crude. The fruit of my loins, you know, that's how you talk about your descendants. It's just so 
unrefined, in my opinion. <laughs> It's just, if, if I ever heard my dad calling me the fruit of his loins, I'd say, watch your mouth, you know. <laughs> watch your <laughs> And I would have risked being. <laughs> the, no, it, it, to me, the, ooh, this phrase. Yea, Joseph truly said, the, here we go. Thus saith the Lord, Troy Sierra, I raise up the fruit of my loins, and he shall be esteemed highly among the fruit of thy loins. And unto him I will give commandment that he shall do a work for the fruit of thy loins, his brethren, which shall be of great worth unto them, even to the bringing of them to the knowledge of the covenants which I've made with thy fathers. He just explains the previous verse. Th this, this is the thing. The prophecy explains <laughs> the introduction. <laughs> this is like, this to me, it's like this chapter has so many inconsistencies that are so different and if you really spent time studying this chapter and looking at it closely and reading the one before and the one after you're gonna see this is you know if I were a teacher and somebody was giving me consecutive papers or oh, you okay little boom beam boom beam um this would suddenly be this is so different and people can say well that's because you know Joseph of Egypt wrote it Okay, but it's just so different to me, okay? And, and I will give unto a commander that he shall do none other work. This is going to be his, this person's life work. And we all know they're talking about Joseph Smith. Say the work which I shall command him, and I will make him great in mine eyes, for he shall do my work. And so many people here are like, oh my goodness, Joseph Smith is such an egomaniac. He's not an egomaniac. It's just that he is... Um, the work that he is about, and this also echoes, we see in Alma 26 later on, this is the greatest work you can do, you know? <laughs> no matter what profession you have, the greatest you, work you can do is, is delivering people out of captivity who are in bondage to idiocy. That is the greatest work, you know? And, and people who are delivered from false doctrines, that is the greatest work. People can die happy if they die with the truth, you know, but people soaked in lies, they die miserable deaths because they don't know what's going on. So J Joseph Smith has added a lot of information to our understanding of mortality that has made that feel seamless. The pre-mortal to the mortal to the next life, that it's like all one big program. And, and that information that he has brought has, has really echoed a lot of near-death experiences what he has taught has not only been described in many ways in the Book of Mormon, but also people who've had near-death experiences come back talking like Joseph Smith very often. So that's, that's why, you know, to me, the man continues to resonate with my heart, despite the things that he is accused of and the motivations behind them. Because they're not only accusing him of the crime, they're claiming to know what was in his heart with this action and what he intended. So, so that's to me where a lot of the criticism of Joseph Smith falls apart is because these people are so hateful. <laughs> if you could talk about Joseph Smith without a sneer on your face, I would listen to you. But every person that talks about Joseph Smith it's like, I can, you know, if they were a cartoon, you'd see steam coming out of their ears. You'd see the spit flying. <laughs> it's like, okay, that, that makes me, like I said, I have a standard, like that carrying the rattlesnakes across. I have the standard in my mind and heart. And if you don't represent that frequency, that vibration of carrying the rattlesnakes across the river <laughs> on sticks to save them, and you're frothing at the mouth and you're smoking at the ears, I cannot hear a word you're saying. I don't care what good points, you know, and I don't care how many millions of viewers you have. If you are sneering and looking down on things you don't understand, you're a joke. You're a joke. You don't know what you're talking about. And the thing that's going to be so painful is on Judgment Day when all these people are going to have painful realizations that their very harsh judgments of other people, and this goes for everybody, this goes for everybody, all their harsh judgments of people, even people that seem to have committed the worst crimes, that our harsh judgments of people were so wrong. We were wrong probably in every case of what was really happening and what was really going on and what led to certain events. and. 
and, and, and all the heartbreak that went behind a lot of the tragedies we see. Um, and you're going to be, you're, you're going to feel really bad about the way that you judged others harshly. And it's going to come back to you again as the scriptures, you know, with what judgment you hand out, that's going to be handed right back to you. So that's why it behooves us to, to be merciful and to not rob ourselves of beautiful gems of truth because we find fault with others. And I will give unto him a command, so he's not going to do anything. His work is going to be great. He shall be great like unto Moses. Absolutely. Like I said, if you're delivered from bondage, um, no matter what kind of bondage it is, yeah, you are Moses, whom I have said I would raise up unto you to deliver my people, O house of Israel, and Moses will I raise up to deliver thy people out of the land of Egypt. And that's the thing. Okay, so verse 9, he's like, and he shall be great like unto Moses. Wait, who? Who's Moses? You're Joseph. This is Joseph of Egypt talking. He just got there. He just got to Egypt. Who the heck is Moses? He doesn't know Moses. And so in the next verse, it says, and Moses will I raise up. <laughs> Do you see the problems that this chapter presents for me? Because Joseph wouldn't have known about Moses. And if he did know about Moses, like it implies here, why in the heck did he not get out of there with his people the moment he knew that they were going to be enslaved like that? I don't know. That, that to me is, you know, are you such a person that you're like, well, my brother sold me into Egypt. So you know what? I think that their, their, their offspring, you know, the fruit of their loins <laughs> for gener can suffer for generations in the most brutal slavery. Yeah. Yeah, mm. that does not make any sense to me at all, that he would think that that was okay, that anybody should be a slave to anybody, and that it was okay, and that children and generations should be born into slavery. The idea that Joseph of Egypt was okay with that to me, that's like that. That th this is why this chapter, to me, I, I wish they'd take it out. Quite honestly, I wish they'd take it out because the more you think about it and the more you ponder on it, the more problems you find with this chapter. Um, and, but a seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins. See, here's the thing again. But a seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins. The Lord is is telling Joseph of Egypt that he is going to raise a fruit. <laughs> from his fruit, that he's going to be a direct descendant. <laughs> and they're saying that Joseph Smith is a direct descendant of Joseph of Egypt. See, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he is. But DNA can misprove that. You know, 23andMe has complicated things for Mormons. Because now they're saying, yeah, no. They're not the principal people. No, you're wrong. There is no evidence of it, genetically of what you're saying. We have not found, but you know, yet you have to always put a yet on it because they're, you know, like in my 23andMe, I have Ashkenazi Jew. How interesting is that? Where'd that come from? You know, I'm most, I'm Native American, but I'm also Ashkenazi Jew. I shared DNA with Ashkenazi Jew. I thought that was interesting. Um, so, you know, yet. So you say yet. <laughs> Nevertheless, you can test one of Joseph Smith's descendants and, and go back really far. <laughs> and it, it'd probably be pretty easy to determine. So, again, do I believe that Joseph Smith is his direct descendant of Joseph of Egypt? No, I don't. And unto him will I give power to bring forth my word unto the seed of my loins, of thy loins, and not to the bringing forth my word only, saith the Lord, but to the convincing them of my word, which shall have gone forth already among them. Okay, so he's referring now to the Bible, that there's going to be a Bible, <laughs> which is like, so Joseph of Egypt is talking about a Bible, you know? So I just, it, it, it's hard for me. I mean, I know... You want to say the stick of Judah and all that and, and, and refer to this scripture and 
it's okay wherefore the fruit of my loins shall write the fruit of the loins of judah shall write and that which shall be written by the fruit of thy loins and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of judah shall grow together unto the confounding of the false doctrines laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins and bringing them to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter days and also to the knowledge of my covenant saith the lord okay so there's a lot of fruit and there's a lot of loins and there's um a lot of writing Okay, so he's saying that the Bible and the Book of Mormon are going to become one, and they're going to, because the Mormons love to use that idea, if you just have one dot of truth, why, you can spin it any which way you want. And they're saying, well, if you have two dots, why, that fixes it. Well, I have news, you can spin an arrow too, you know. <laughs> so there goes that metaphor. <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> the thing is, is that it's it's just, it should, it should, if, if you believe that God speaks to everyone everywhere, this should lay down contentions, it should. The Book of Mormon should have. If you believe that everybody's, you know, has a degree of glory, or, or I'm sorry, if babies, for example, are not born guilty, then none of us are born guilty. Why, you know, that should lay down some conten contention. <laughs> if you learn that if in our own families we don't fix our problems that it leads to war, that should, should make us think twice of what happens in our families and how we treat each other. You know, so, so there, it should have, <laughs> and for those who do believe it, in some ways, it, in many ways it does. It does all those, all that and above. And out of weakness, he shall be made strong. We're still talking about Joseph Smith here. And that day when my work shall commence among all my people unto the restoring thee, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. So the restoration, referring to the restoration. And thus prophesied Joseph, saying, Behold, that seer will the Lord bless, and they that seek to destroy him shall be confounded. So apparently, um, confounded doesn't imply safety <laughs> if they seek to destroy him it doesn't say i'll stop them or, or they're, they're going to be confounded that's all they're confused these are confused people no doubt they're confused people um they shall be confounded maybe you can interpret it that means they won't be successful but we know that's not true because <laughs> they were they killed him so to me confounded can be these are confused people they're they're going to be confounded people they're going to be ignorant people. They're going to be confused people. That's what it means to me. They shall be um, confounded. For this promise, which I have obtained of the fruit of my loins, shall be fulfilled. Behold, I am sure the fulfilling of this promise, again, in that word sure, I am sure. <laughs> it just sounds so different from the vocabulary of the rest of the Book of Mormon that, yeah, I, I got problems with this. And his name shall be called after me, and it shall be after the name of his father. Again, we have these annoying way of describing things, like fruit of the land. Just say his name's Joseph. His, his name shall be Joseph, too. Just say it. What's this weird? Okay, unto me, for the thing which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand, by the power of the Lord shall bring my people unto salvation. Yes, I believe that the many people shall experience salvation because they can't accept Christianity in any other way. I can't, I can, the way, Christ, like I've shared before, I can't accept Christianity that says babies are born guilty. I, that's, no. The God that says that and believes that, no. So this does bring salvation to people that cannot accept Christianity in any other way. <clears throat> and instead of all the hatred that, that the, the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith received, they, people should, if they're really truly Christian, they should know this. They should, they, they, the Holy Spirit should have told them this, that there are some things that people can only accept if it is dressed in a certain way, if it's presented in a certain way. Otherwise, they cannot accept it. And so if you're really spiritually evolved, you would know this and you would not make 50 billion videos about why so-and-so is going to hell and these people and those people and da, da, da. Um, I'm sure this thing for the Lord has said unto me, I'll proceed, preserve thy um, seed forever. So, okay, so again, he's another side of Moses, I guess. And the Lord has said, I will raise up a Moses. I will give power unto him a rod. Usually rod is like a scroll or it's usually like the rod of iron. It's used, somehow equated with scriptures. And I will give judgment unto him in writing, yet I will not lose his tongue that he shall speak much, for I will not make him mighty in speaking, but I will write unto him my law by the finger of mine own hand, and I will make a spokesman for him. So many people have said the spokesman is the Book of Mormon. So he, that is his spokesman for Joseph Smith. Because, um, and, the, and if that's true, 
<laughs> how did everything else come about? If the, if the Book of Mormon is true and the Book of Mormon is the spokesman for Joseph Smith, then what is all this other stuff? What is all this, you know, Masonic temple rites? What, are, what, what is all this, you know, way of dressing, you know, using garments? What, what is all this other stuff? What is this word of wisdom? And in many ways, it is a word of wisdom until they try to make it like, you know, COVID, you know, 19 times. Do this or you're arrested. You know, it's like, wait a minute, this was a recommendation. Now it's being enforced. It was, it's the same vibe, okay? So, I mean, there's, there, there's, there's things <clears throat> to me that just are inexplicable <laughs> in this chapter. Because if that's the truth, if the Book of Mormon is the spokesman, who is this other, what's all this other talking then? And I behold, will I will give unto him that he shall write the writing of the fruit of thy loins unto um, the fruit of thy loins and the spokesman of thy loins shall declare it. So the Book of Mormon is going to be going through Joseph Smith back to them again. See, that's what I'm saying. It's like, can't you just say that? And the words which he shall write shall be the words which are expedient in my wisdom should go forth unto the fruit of thy loins. And it shall be as if the fruit of thy loins had cried unto them from the dust, for I know their faith. Again, it's going to have a familiar spirit. It's going to ring true. It's going to be something that's going to go from the bottom of our feet all the way up through our crown. <laughs> We're going to, it's going to ring through our body. It's going to be like from the dust and it's going to have a familiar voice. They shall cry from the dust, yea, even repentance unto their brethren, even after many generations have gone by them. And it shall come to pass that their cry shall go even according to the simpleness of their words. Okay, the fact that even... <laughs> has the nerve to say simpleness of their words right there it just chops my hide this has been anything but simple this whole chapter has been the most convoluted and i hope it is the only most convoluted chapter in the whole book of Mormon. no the only place where you know the simpleness no thanks for trying to point it out but that is not what i'm experiencing right now because of their faith, their words shall proceed forth out of my out of my mouth unto their brethren who are the fruit of thy loins, and the weakness of their words will I make strong in their faith unto the remembering of my covenant which I made unto thy fathers. And now behold, my son Joseph, after this manner did my father of old prophesy. So again, um, and there's the fruit of the loins, by the way, is in the, jo um, the Joseph Smith translation. <laughs> I'm going to say Joseph Smith insertion on Genesis chapter 50. Um, so at least he kept that consistent. You know? But um, he's saying that these words, he, it's all about the Book of Mormon is, is what is it's sounding like in that and how instrumental Joseph Smith is bringing, is to bring it forth. Of course he's instrumental. Of course he is. And then now, um, wherefore, because of this covenant, thou art blessed for thy seed shall not be destroyed for they shall hearken unto the words of the book and there shall rise the book, meaning, um, the, the book of Mormon, I guess the spokesman, that, that's, that's the one that they're going to, um, they're going to listen to that. It's going to be familiar to them and there's going to be truths that they're going to recognize. Now, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people are in this religion because of tradition. So, you know, you can almost count all those out because, I mean, not to be cruel. But they didn't arrive at the truth from their own investigation. They were just handed, it, it was just given to them and they're like, okay. You know, and they just went along by and large. And there's no, and they're the ones that tell you don't think, don't think, just don't think about it. And because that's their culture. You know, when I was in Thailand, people would say, what religion are you? If you asked a Thai, what religion are you? They'd say, well, I'm Thai. <laughs> that's my religion. By that, they meant they were Buddhist, you know. <laughs> but it's so, being that person is so ingrained that it, 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 it speaks for your religion too. So being born into a Mormon family very often, especially when the population all around you is the same, it's like your, your, your identity, your religion is kind of your citizenship, you know? And when you revoke, if you question your religion and find any problem, why then your citizenship's going to be revoked. So you don't question a lot and you don't think a lot. 
and you just hold on to community rather than trusting, you know, in God that he's got you. You can dig as deep as you want and you can know everything you want and he's got you. And he, he's got you right here in his hand and you can explore and question away and he will take no truth from you that you've already arrived at and that is sunk deep in your soul and etched deeply into your spirit. And you can question as much as you want and that it's not a sin at all to go to God about anything that you hear a human say and that God delights that we take this up because he, we're, it's our form of worship. We're saying, I'm down here with these mortals. I need to go to you. I don't care what mortal it is. They don't compare to you. They'll never compare to you unless they become glorified in that same way. But until then, you're the only one I'm going to. I don't care who's talking and, and how it's said or where it's written. I will question everything. <laughs> Starting to sound like a, what? what is that, an Xbox commercial or something? I don't know, some gaming thing. Question everything. But when they say it, it sounds really cre creepy, you know? <laughs> um, so there shall rise up one mighty among them who shall do both much good, both in word and deed, being an instrument in the hands of God, with exceeding faith to work mighty wonders and do that thing which is great in the sight of God, unto the bringing to pass much restoration unto the house of Israel and unto the seed of thy brethren. Again, he's going to do, it's, it's going, it is a mighty work. And you are an instrument in God's hands, which is what Alma the, uh, the Younger, um, or Ammon, I'm sorry, in Alma 26, Ammon. He's raving. He's just going on and on about how awesome it is to be an instrument in God's hands. There is no greater blessing. There is no greater blessing than that. And when, when you are an instrument in God's hands to liberating people from really abominable, and I don't use that word lightly, doctrines that, that tell a young mother that her baby's floating somewhere in some dark limbo because she failed to get that baby baptized before that baby passed away suddenly. And so you're not only going to add to a, a mother's grief for her baby, but you're also going to torment her soul and her mind and her body for the rest of her life because you're telling her her baby went to hell. You know, and many people say, oh, no, limbo isn't hell. Oh, really? <laughs> Some people would say, you know, an emo would say, I'd rather burn forever than feel nothing. You know, oh, really? It's not hell. <laughs> I wasn't aware of the uh, spiritual upgrade, you know, from torment to nothing. <laughs> but yes, yes, to me, that is the greatest work you can do is to free the human mind from lies. That is the greatest work. And yes, you are like a Moses. And yes, you are like a Joseph. Do I believe he literally descended through? No, <laughs> I don't. If I'm proved wrong, I'm going to have such a party that day. You know, and that's the, that's the mindset you want to have when, when studying religion. <laughs> I, I don't believe it, but if I'm proved wrong, ah, glory, hallelujah. I'd love to know that for myself. I'd love to be, you know, a Nephi and carried up on some mountain and shown something grand, you know, and I can come back and go, hey, y'all. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> but I have not had that experience, so I do not know, and I do not believe it. And there are many reasons why I do not believe this prophecy of Joseph. And that it echoes again in the Bible, but it, the part that Joseph put in. You know, and see, even like all these Josephs are confusing. The whole thing is just a mess. And now, blessed art thou, Joseph, behold, thou art little. Wherefore, hearken unto the words of thy brother Nephi. Oh, and I have a huge problem with this. <sighs> I can ever imagine, even though my, my parents, you know, they had their good kids and they had their, <laughs> they're not so good kids like me, you know, even so my mother would never have the nerve, never have the stupidity to say to me, just listen to your sister, you know, or, or just listen to your brother. Never did my mother say that. She may have compared me. <laughs> sometimes, but she, she never told me that here's my dying words to you. Listen to your sister. 
that see to me this is this is like this is the making of a cult <laughs> the any time that you start putting people between you and a person and god anytime somebody tries to stand in that way and tries to direct that traffic that's a cult to me that's a cult you don't direct my traffic and my communication with god no you don't and you don't have that right you can inform me and warn me and minister to me and help me and be a friend, but you cannot stand between me and God and you cannot determine how God feels about me and, 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 and how God sees me. You're not going to tell me <clears throat> how God sees me through your eyes. <laughs> I know how God sees me and I know how God sees each one of you that he's amazed by you and that this whole thing is all for you. <clears throat> but let me just say, behold, thou art litter, wherefore hearken to the words of Nephi and it shall be done unto thee even according to the words which I have spoken. Remember the words of the dying father. Amen. You know, there he goes at the end and remember the words of the dying father. You know, you see, and then, you know, next chapter, he's still like talking on and on. It's like, wow, for someone who's dying, you're sure doing a lot of, you know, your lungs are sure doing great, you know, <clears throat> but... <laughs> I, um, I, I have put off this chapter like you, <laughs> but I am so grateful for the, for the wisdom and for the portrayal and for the greatness of God in this book. Sorry, this has been moved so many times by my little pups. <laughs> And I, I just can't, I just, you know, you want everybody in the world to know that they're a child of God. <clears throat> Honestly, if everybody knew that, if everybody knew, you know, most people feel like Pinocchio. Honestly, they feel like they're, the, they're these little puppets on a string and that they don't matter and that what they do doesn't really matter. And that if they, they skip off here, or they skip off there. Why? It doesn't matter, you know, because you don't matter. And that's the way the world makes you feel, like you are just a puppet, like you're just on strings and that nothing's ever really free and you're never really free. But you are in many ways. You, you, are, you are a child of God and the sky's the limit. And you don't ever need to fear, you know, taking off in flight and, and exploring new vistas. Don't, don't fear that. God loves intelligence. He loves a curious mind. He loves an adventurer. He loves people that will say, I'll go. Those are his favorite people of all. <laughs> Send me. You know, and that doesn't mean, oh, you're going to be a prophet or whatever like that. No, it means you're just willing to go because you know wherever you go, he'll be there. God will be there and you trust him and you trust everything about him and even when things seem wrong or, or, or what you know old, old things that you held to before seem like <clears throat> man this is making less sense here <laughs> he's got you you know he does he does it's that's why your relationship with God first always God first never put in or anything between you and God never do it don't do it and I just hope you're worshiping in a place that teaches these things. And I will talk to you again soon.